Welcome to LG Ministry. I'm so thankful that you have joined me today to hear another lesson from God's Word. I always do my best to present the truth and I hope the lessons that I present to you will challenge you or it will cause you to be uplifted so that you might grow closer to God. So now let's get to our lesson. Anytime you go into a bookstore, you can find a multitude of self-help books that will help you to improve your way of life. Well, in today's lesson, I want to offer you 10 things that will make a difference in our congregation or in any congregation. You might be thinking this is going to be too hard, but it's not. In fact, each one of you can improve your congregation with just a small amount of effort on your part. And I'm going to share with you these 10 simple things you can use to start doing today to improve your congregation or any congregation that you may attend in the future. The first thing you must realize is that you are not perfect and that there is not a perfect congregation out there because it is made up of humans. To clarify, when I say perfect, I mean without sin or doing everything exactly right. The reason I like to define what I mean is because the word perfect can mean mature in the Bible depending on the context. And certainly we can all become mature in the faith, but we will never be flawless in all that we do and neither will the congregation be where you attend. Now, if you think otherwise, please share with me where this perfect person or congregation exists. I would love to be able to know where that's at or who that person is. The only perfect person that has lived on this earth is Jesus. So the sooner we accept this, the better off we will be. Unfortunately, there are many that are always searching for the perfect congregation. But the problem is they will never find it because every congregation has its strengths and its weaknesses. Some Christians come up with all kinds of reasons they don't like a certain congregation. They might say the people are too old or they're too young. There are too many hypocrites in the church. There are too many people that are apathetic. The preacher is too boring. There aren't enough activities in this church, or there are too many activities in this church. This list could go on and on, but when you get right down to it, these are just excuses that some Christians come up with so they can justify in their own minds to miss services and to go to a different church. When someone does change churches, they need to realize that they are just exchanging one set of problems for another, and moving around or staying away from a church is not going to solve their problem, most likely. To illustrate this idea of how every church has its own problems, consider the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Each one of the churches had difficulties associated with them. We were given a brief review of their conditions. First is the church at Ephesus. This was a very strong congregation that was working hard for the Lord. But there was a problem. They fell short in the area of love. This is why Jesus said in Revelation 2 verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Second is the church at Smyrna. They were a poor church and they were suffering from heavy persecutions and they were told that they were going to be suffering even more. And some of them would be thrown into prison. Third is the church at Pergamos, which was located in a bad place. And Jesus said they were in the location of Satan's throne. Some of them even died for the cause of Christ, but some of their members were involved in false teachings, as Jesus said in Revelation 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Fourth, the church at Thyatira, 
They were known for their good works, but they had allowed a false woman teacher to serve in their church. And since they had not dealt with this problem, she had caused some of these Christians to engage in fornication, idolatry, and false teachings. Fifth was the church at Sardis. This church had been active in the past, but now they were considered being a dead church by Jesus. However, there were a few of its members that were still uh, active, and they were doing great things for God. But the majority was doing nothing. Sixth was the church at Philadelphia. This was a faithful church, but notice what Jesus says about them in Revelation 3, verse number 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. When Jesus said they had little strength, this could mean several things. It could mean that they didn't have very much influence in their community, or it could mean they were small in number. So to be effective in their church, everyone would have to give everything they had to keep the faith and to use opportunities that God had given them. Finally, seventh was the church at Laodicea. This was a wealthy church and they could buy whatever they needed, but their riches had caused them to become spiritually dead without them even knowing it. Which one of these congregations would you want to be a member of? Some had more problems than others, but they all had their difficulties. So this proves that there is not a perfect church. So instead of making excuses to stop coming to church or to go to a different church, you should try to become a solution to the problems and do what you can to strengthen the church that you're in. In other words, instead of running away, roll up your sleeves and get busy for the Lord. Now, I do realize that sometimes Christians have to move from one congregation to another because they have tried to make a difference, but no one is interested in what they have to say. Sometimes that congregation might become very worldly and become obsessed with pleasing the people and watering down the word. There can also be other legitimate reasons for one to leave one congregation for another. So I want to be clear, if you can stay and make a difference, then do so. However, if you choose to move from one church to another, pray about it carefully and consider if it is the right thing for you to do that will help you and your family's spiritual health. But don't just move based on a rash de decision. The second thing is for you to focus on the good qualities of your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have the wrong attitude, you're going to find yourselves trying to think about everything bad about every person in every situation. And when that becomes our primary goal, we'll be nitpicking everything to death and it will cause us to have a negative attitude about others and about ourselves. Paul teaches us that we will find what we're looking for. Titus 1 verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. If you take an optimistic approach to life, then you will be more focused on the good qualities that people have. People who are optimistic tend to be happier people. However, if you are a pessimistic person, you tend to find everything wrong with every person in every situation. You assume the worst instead of the best. Personally, I try to be optimistic, but I think I'm more of a realist most of the time because I tend to look at things as they are and base my decision on the facts instead of assuming the negative or positive of a situation or a person. But I do try to lean toward the positive side. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So we are to stay away from evil, but we are to hold fast to what is good. However, sometimes we are guilty of staying away from good things just because there's a little evil close by. And sometimes this evil is our own perception. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that your brother in Christ lies to you once about something they didn't want you to know, and you found out that they lied to you. Should you reject that Christian and avoid them because of this one lie? No, you should not. That one lie should not cause you to reject all the other good things that person has done. This does not mean that their lying is acceptable, nor does it mean that you can't go to them and let them know that what they did was wrong, because they do need to be corrected, but they don't need to be rejected. So try your best to find the good in people and not the bad, because you'll find what you're looking for. It happens every single time. If you're looking for bad things, you'll find bad things. If you're looking for good things, then you'll find good things. 
The third thing you can do if you are old is to treat the young people how you would want to be treated when you were young. If you are young, treat the older people with the respect you want to be treated with when you become old. This idea is taught by Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we can learn to have this attitude, it will help us a long way in how to treat each other. Before we say something rude or yell at someone, we need to ask ourselves, what would I want someone to do if I was in that place? How would I want them to speak to me? Whenever we don't like something, again, we need to make sure that we think about what we want to say about that. Because a lot of times whenever we say negative things and we say something in the moment without really processing it, we're going to end up being full of regret and you cannot take back what you said. Yes, we can be forgiven, but the emotional scars will remain. When we learn to treat each other the way we want to be treated, it will cause a church to be more productive because there will be less strife. There is a lot more harmony when the old and the young work together. Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy was going to be respected by the church at Corinth, and he wrote the following, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 10. Now if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. He also told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Sometimes older people don't have much respect for the young because they don't feel like they have lived long enough or have enough wisdom to be teaching them anything so they will despise them for their youth. This should not be the case. Instead, the older people should encourage these younger people to share their wisdom with them so they can become wiser. A person who's full of wisdom shouldn't keep their wisdom to themselves because that is not wise. Instead, they should look for opportunities to share that wisdom so that the church will be stronger and wiser. Young people should not think that they know it all and they shouldn't be too proud to learn from older people. The writer of Proverbs says, Proverbs 3, verse 13, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Proverbs 8, 11, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Young people need to realize that older people have already been through many of the situations that you have been through. And they have plenty of wisdom that you can tap into and to use if you're wise enough to do that. All of us should respect the wisdom and leadership of the elders. In fact, I would encourage you to read 1 Timothy chapter 5 because it teaches us how we are to treat the young, the old, and our elders. The fourth thing you can do is when you are tempted to criticize others for what they are doing, pray for them first. It might not change them or make them better, but it will do wonders for your attitude. It's easy for us to see the faults in others, but it's more difficult for us to see our own faults. When we can examine ourselves and see our faults, we won't be so quick to criticize others. Jesus gave this advice, Matthew 7, verse number 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Sometimes we are so blind to our own faults that we criticize others for doing the same things that we are guilty of. This is one area that our children can help us with because they copy our behavior and they make similar responses as we do. And we see how they act and react to others. Our eyes can be opened to how we behave and how we look to others because they will copy the same phrases and use the same tone that we use, but we see it coming out of their mouths, or you could say we hear it coming out of their mouths. This can teach us how we sound to others. Now, before we're critical of others, we need to take an inventory of ourselves. And once we have ourselves in good shape, then we're going to be more caring and well-equipped to help someone else with their problems. This is what David did. Notice what he wrote in Psalm 51, verse 9. 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Sometimes it is difficult for some of us not to be critical or judgmental, but we must learn to nip it in the bud. Even if we have someone that is treating us wrong and calling us names, we must dig down deep and be the bigger person so they can learn from us. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Also, Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse number 8, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessings, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now the fifth thing that you can do to improve the church is when you see that a work is being neglected or work that needs to be done. Don't complain about it or wish that someone else would take care of it. Instead, do something about it. You do something about it. Either do the work yourself or offer to help someone else to do the work. Complaining and wishing uh, just doesn't get the work done. A great example of this comes from Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king of Persia, which was an honorable position. But when Nehemiah found out that Jerusalem was lying in ruins, he asked the king if he could go and help his fellow Jews rebuild the city, and he let him go. When he got to Jerusalem, the people had stopped working because they had allowed Samballat and his companions, railings, to discourage them. But Nehemiah didn't criticize his people. Instead, he inspired them, and he got them busy building on the wall again, and they completed it in 52 days. Nehemiah saw that a work needed to be done, and he did it. And he got all the people involved. When there is work to be done, who are you like? Are you like Nehemiah or Samballat? If you're more like Sam Ballot, you need to realize that not only does complaining, he doesn't get anything accomplished, it can also cause others to be discouraged and make them not want to do any work for the Lord. However, if we develop the attitude of Nehemiah, think about what could be done, all the work that could be accomplished if you had his attitude. You'd be able to accomplish your goals. As Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, or device, or knowledge, or wisdom in the grave where you're going. As Christians, we should want to give our best to God because He gave us His best. So if you see something that needs to be done, do it. Well, this is the first five things that we can do that will make a congregation, or any congregation as far as that goes, better and more productive for the Lord. Let me give you those five things again. Number one, you need to realize that you are not perfect and there's not a perfect congregation. Number two, focus on the good qualities of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And number three, everyone should treat each other as they would like to be treated. Number four, when you are tempted to criticize others for what they are doing, pray for them first. And number five, don't complain about what needs to be done. Instead, do the work yourself or help someone else do it. These first five things are not that hard to do, and it's something that we can all do that will make our congregations stronger and more productive for the Lord. We have five more things to go, but I hope you will join us next time so you can listen to these five things and you can also apply them. Because if you apply all ten things in both of these lessons, I believe that you'll be able to make your congregation about as strong as it can be. I sure do appreciate you listening to my lesson today. I hope that you found it something that is biblical, something that was encouraging, or maybe again challenged you to change your life, or just maybe gave you something to think about. 
I think it's so important that we listen and that we study God's Word as much as we can. Now, one thing I want to be clear on is I want you to never take my word at just because I say it so. Now, I do my best to study God's Word and I try to make sure that I'm always presenting the truth, but I am just a man. I can make mistakes. So compare what I say to God's Word. If you do that, you can't go wrong. And if you find that I'm teaching something that is incorrect, I mean, you can turn to Scripture and you can say, look what it says here. Please contact me and let me know because I'm very concerned. I want to make sure that I am proclaiming the truth. Another thing that you can do that will be helpful to you is you can go on YouTube. You can search out LG Ministry and you can look for my videos there as well. And you will find, uh, I don't know, it's over like, I think it's close to 500 videos now or more. But there will be many lessons that you can continue to watch and you continue to grow from. Please let people know about this so that other people can see the truth taught. Again, I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope that you continue to run the race and to remain faithful to God until the day that you die.